Hi, my name is Tracy and I've been a rabbit owner for 10 plus years and a rabbit boarder for almost seven years. Tyranda's chosen topic for episode one is vaccinations. Rabbits require two annual vaccine injections. Now this covers three vaccines over the two injections and we'll go into this in more detail now. Rabbits require two different injections as of 2019 and 2020. The first usual vaccine that your vet will offer will be the Nobivac vaccine. This covers the usual myxomatosis virus and the RVHD1 in full name, Rabbit Viral Hemorrhagic Disease Variant 1. The second injection is as important. This covers both RVHD viruses, so RVHD1 again, but more importantly, RVHD2, which is Rabbit Viral Hemorrhagic Disease Variant 2, also known as the Fulavac vaccine. Now there is a third optional one, which is called the Erivac vaccine, and this just covers RVHD2. The only problem with this is it's only proven for nine months coverage, not 12 months like the other two. So let's have a look at the vaccines individually. Nobivac covers myxomatosis and RVHD1, as said above. This is the main vaccine that vets usually do. Pets at home give you a voucher for it if you buy a rabbit from them, and it's a usual routine vaccination. However, the second one, Filovac, which covers RVHD2, is more important now more than ever. We will look at the various viruses in depth in a different video, but this is mainly a how vaccines work, how important they are, why you need to get them done every year, why you need to get them done regardless of whether your rabbit is indoors or outdoors. So let's have a look at the history of these vaccines and the viruses. Where do these viruses come from? Let's just say as a first note, these viruses were manufactured by humans to kill as many rabbits as possible by the millions so where do these viruses come from that we in the UK need to have vaccines for our domestic rabbits? Unfortunately, the problem is with us humans is that all viruses are man-made because of the Australian population rabbit problem. They have a massive wild rabbit population and these were not indigenous to the country. They were actually introduced by us English people in the 18th century and it's an incredibly invasive species rabbits breed like bunnies and they have no natural predators in Australia. So bunnies do what bunnies do best and breed and breed and breed. Various methods have been used to control the rabbit population but with no real success. Hence the use of biochemical warfare. The myxomatosis vaccine was introduced in the rabbit population in Australia, France and Chile in 1950 and did have a significant effect in the rabbit population. It killed loads. Unfortunately, the ones that did survive did become naturally immune. And then they do what bunnies do. They pass on that genetic information with the next generation of rabbits. Then in 1991, the RVHD1 was manufactured and this was released into the Australian rabbit population. This was so devastating to the rabbit population in Australia, but those that were not killed again did the same and became immune. So in 2012, RVHD2 was released and this is the second variant of that same RVHD virus, which again had the same effect, but not as lethal. RVHD1 and myxomatosis are generally 100% fatal. RVHD2, however, is only 80% fatal, which means that the morbidity rate is 20%. So animals that don't die end up being a carrier for life. Australia still has a massive rabbit population problem. The current population stands at two to 300 million rabbits, and that was as of 1991. As of 2016, it's roughly 200 million. So these vaccines didn't do a lot to, to really impact it, maybe stop the spread, but really didn't impact the numbers all that much. So who knows what it is now? So how do these viruses that are manufact manufactured by us humans, usually in China, for the Australian rabbit population problem, get to us specifically in the UK? Again, it's humans. Either a lack of biosecurity or biocontrol 
in either country, be it Australia or China, as it's usually transported in trucks, in wagons, shipping containers or planes. This is speculation, I don't actually know how it's transported, but you can imagine how it's transported, refrigerated carriers, that sort of thing. And they go backwards and forwards. And as we see with most zombie films and the recent corona outbreak, viruses will not be contained and it takes a lot to contain them. So be it on the bottom of trucks, tires, shoes on humans, whether it's on our clothes, we are vectors and it will eventually get to us. And we saw it actually get to us in round about 2012, but the vaccine only really started to become available 2016, 2017. And I was ringing around all the vets to figure out who had stock, who had decent stock and would, who would have recurring stock. And it took almost a full year before vets did start to properly stock the new vaccine, the Filovac vaccine specifically, Aerovac as well, but mostly Filovac because of the 12 month annual coverage that it gives. Vaccines should be mandatory at all responsible boarding services or establishments, just like kennel cough and parvo virus for kennels, for dogs. We have to make it mandatory. There has to be a herd immunity directly from the company that we spoke to, Filovac, and it will be in the description below, a link to the, um, the PDF of what they sent. Filovi, the French company, um, advised us between 14 to 21 days after the last injection before rabbits can be boarded. So they have full immunity, they've had a chance to get over the vet visit, and we all know that's stressful. So it, 14 to 21 days is cast as an initial coverage. We also had information from them about what's called non-continuous cover. This is the lapsed time that you have in between the 12 month leave ending and a new 12 monthly being done. So if your rabbit was vaccinated on the 1st of February, 2018, with the Filovac vaccine specifically, and we'll add in the Nobivac for that, even though they need to be done two weeks apart. But specifically, if you've had a vaccine done on the 1st of February, be it Nobivac or Filovac, you have seven days before it's classed as non-continual cover. So you have from the 1st to the 7th to get it done. If you have it the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, then we have to class that back as initial coverage, which would again require the 14 to 21 days before you could board it anywhere. Now this is just specific to borders, but as an owner, you need to know that's what the manufacturing company says that you need to do to keep it as continual coverage. Obviously, if you get it a day or two before the 1st, 30th, 31st, then you're fine. If you need to push it a week or two in advance, again, absolutely fine, continual coverage. But if you lapse that by seven days, then you have to be classed as non-continual coverage and then your rabbit is at risk. I don't know if that's true and obviously vaccines don't just turn off at 365 days or be it 370 odd days obviously not but that's what the manufacturers have given us as advice and that's what we need to follow as borders and owners now specifically about the myxomatosis vaccine which is the nobivac vaccine and as a little side effect most vaccines do not come with side effects we've not seen any from the rvhd1 or 2 most of the time if a rabbit declines after a vaccine appointment it's usually just the stress of the journey the the stress of being manhandled and then the sulk when they get home potentially leading to gi stasis or, or gas and bloat it's generally not the vaccine that's at fault however as a side note the myxomatosis one can cause a side effect and we've only ever seen this specifically in Netherland dwarf rabbits, and it's called nodular myxomatosis, which is a very mild form of the myxomatosis virus. It can come with little lumps and bumps all over the nose or around the eyes. We had it with little Poogie last year. If anyone knows Poogie, she had just two little nodules. And then after a couple of weeks, the scabs fell off, left her with a little bit of bald spot from obviously the follicles had gone from the fur. But she was no worse for the work, didn't seem to bother her in any way. And we do know of other. Netherland dwarfs that have had this vaccine um, just a little touch of a just a problem with it and 
we've never really seen in any other rabbits. The only other one that I can think of is that occasionally at the vaccine site where they inject in the back of the neck, they can get a little jelly-like lump. And again, that's just a local reaction to being injected with it. Generally, it can go either one way. It can be a jelly-like or slightly hard lump that after a couple of weeks will, will just disappear on its own, or it will turn into like a crater. And it looks, it looks horrible, and it looks like a bot fly thing. But again, it's just a local reaction to the vaccine injection. And it generally goes with just observation and just make sure it doesn't get any worse. The main problem we face as rabbit owners, and specifically as a rabbit borner, is misinformation or the lack of information from the professionals, the vets. Vets giving out the wrong information is something that I've had to struggle with leading to people believing that indoor rabbits don't require any vaccinations or that the vaccines, specifically the Filovac one, is not necessary. And this is completely not true, absolutely not true. If your rabbit, be it indoors or outdoors, it is susceptible to all three viruses. These come on biting flies in the summer, so you need fly screens or the, the fly prevention, um, what's it called, rear guard and some vets do add rear guard into the uh, care plans that they do. Ty and Mel are in the complete care package, which is eight pounds a month from companion care, and that rear guard is included. I think there's two applications. Um, so fly strike is a problem, but mostly it's biting flies and, and myxomatosis, that that's kind of what it's used for. But RVHD2 are more importantly infected by you or the hay you feed your rabbit. Hear me out, okay. So hay comes from fields specifically. Hay is grown in a field, it is cut and dried, it's fed to your rabbits. Now think for a moment, what's in that field? What lives in that field? There's bugs, there's mites, there's animals, there's birds, and very likely wild rabbits. So it doesn't matter where you buy your hay from, be it store-bought or from a farm, it comes from <laughs> a field that potentially has rabbits and those rabbits are wild and not vaccinated so regardless of whether your rabbit is vaccinated or not you still have that potential risk and this is in no way meant to put you off buying hay please don't hay needs to be 85 percent of your rabbit's diet hay is good hay is very good but it comes with maybe a problem of mites which we've seen from a couple of companies mold that we've seen from a couple of companies but this hay is just dried grass and it always has the potential to carry risk. If it's barn dried, obviously the vaccine is not, the virus is not killed. If it's kiln dried, like, like some of the stuff from, from, you know, manufacturers, I wouldn't say, I won't say who, but uh, if it's looking orange and dead and kind of crinkly, then it's been kiln dried, which is for mass production. Get it dry as fast as possible. Get it out, get it out. But again, this kiln drying still doesn't kill it all off. So it might kill some of it off, but not all of it. So again, you have the potential risk if your indoor rabbit, who's not vaccinated, eats it, it is still a vector. And this goes for both Timothy hay and meadow hay. We use both here. Meadow hay is our toilet hay because it's nice and cheap and I buy it from the local farm. And Timothy hay, we buy it from a farm in Scotland and we buy it in, in 54 kilo sacks. Well, it's like six sacks of nine kilos. Um, but again, these are both just barn dried and it's the best way to do it. It keeps its nutrition. Not that hay has a lot of nutrition, it's mostly fiber, but it keeps its fiber content, it's always nice and green, it always looks very fresh and it smells like green tea, it's amazing. But there is the potential risk that the, vac the virus is, is there. And as a border, we always say, and we always have it mandatory, that all bunnies need to be vaccined, vaccinated. Sorry. Um, and this is not about your rabbit bringing it in, it's more if it's already here. It's colourless, it's odourless, it's a very hardy virus and we will go more into these viruses. Um, calcivirus is the same type of thing. These are called non-enveloping viruses, which means that they don't need a protective sheath. So they're quite hardy creatures in their own right. Obviously they're not alive, but we'll pretend they're alive. Um, they can survive 
very low temperatures, very high temperatures for a very long time. And the disinfectants that we use here have to be used on, on, on everything that we can, but we can't disinfect everything. The wooden furniture, the cottages, our clothes, grass, anything along those lines, we can't disinfect. So as long as everyone's in, immune as much as we can with the vaccines, then our potential risk is, is very low. As, as low as we can potentially get it. And this is why it's super important to vaccinate all domestic rabbits. We need that herd immunity to stop the virus spreading. And unfortunately, RVHD2 did mutate last year and is now decimating both the wild rabbit population and the wild hare population, which causes other problems because then predators who would naturally predate these species are going hungry and the next available source of food is domestic stock. And that's terrible. And it shouldn't be happening, but it is. So, when do we vaccinate? Well, myxomatosis and RVHD1 don't usually kill small baby rabbits. Baby, baby rabbits. RVHD2 do, absolutely does. RVHD2 will kill rabbits at eight weeks old. So, breeders, <laughs> what we call greeders now um, and rescue centers should be vaccinating all eight week old rabbits with the Filovac vaccine or the Erikvac vaccine as a minimum and then again at 10 weeks so it's only two weeks apart but they need the same vaccine twice so RVHD2 at eight weeks RVHD2 at 10 weeks this will hopefully keep baby rabbits alive because RVHD2 does not discriminate discriminate because myxomatosis and RVHD1 don't generally kill young rabbits. And this is where we see a problem of pets at home selling baby rabbits at 8 to 10 weeks. Because we know they lie sometimes and they say 12, but what they actually mean is 8. Um, and then you get them home and then two weeks later they're dead. Because they didn't have immunity to RVHD2. And Ty, who might be in one of these corners, when I bought her from pets at home, I know. I know, but I haven't bought a bunny rabbit from pets at home since. I literally didn't even leave the store. I bought her. I took her to the back to companion care, got her on the care plan, had her vaccinated, took her home. And at that time, did another appointment for the Nobivac vaccine, which is your myxomatosis RVHD1 in two weeks, we took her back. So I hadn't even left the store before I got her vaccinated because I knew RVHD2 is the worst and it will kill your rabbit and it's completely unsymptomatic one minute your rabbit can be fine you go to bed the next morning it's almost dead there's no blood there's no swelling there's no inappetence your rabbit just dies and unless there's actually hemorrhage out the nose um you you won't know and generally there isn't that either which also causes the problem of how wide is this is spread, how many rabbits have died from this, because the numbers are just completely inaccurate. The RWAF do as best they can to try and get accurate figures, but generally post-mortems are not done. And for a concise and definitive diagnosis of RVHD2 needs a liver biopsy after death. So your bunny needs to have a post-mortem and a lot of bunnies do not. They're either buried in the garden, they're directly cremated. So the numbers are not accurate on how many deaths have been caused by RVHD2 since it was introduced into the UK a couple of years ago. It's a very sad, sad thing to say and vaccines are our only protection and even then the vaccines aren't 100 percent and unfortunately we still keep making these viruses there is now a rumor of rvhd3 now i don't know anything about this and there is just a rumor i have no idea if it's actually being made or whether it's scaremongering but it's probably quite likely that RVHD3 is in the mix for the rabbit population. And obviously with Australia being devastated by what has been the recent wildfires, I have no idea what that's done to the rabbit population. Um, we won't know any figures, I guess, for quite some time. So who knows? Um, 
and there is light at the end of the tunnel for us specifically as a rabbit border there might be something called the knobby vac plus coming knobby vac plus sorry and this will have all three so both myxomatosis rvhd1 and rvhd2 in one injection which means less stress for your bunny because it only means one injection and one journey but it also means when someone says it's fully vaccinated, we will know it's fully vaccinated as opposed to someone saying fully vaccinated and actually just mean having the RVHD1 myxomatosis one, not the Filovac one as well. And that does cause some confusion, which is why we always ask for a veterinary certificate, uh, a vaccination certificate from your vets, uh, just uploaded to an email or whatever. So we can see exactly what you have had as a rabbit owner. Um, and it covers us, it covers you, your bunny is at as least risk as possible. It's well worth doing. And a lot of care plans do now have both included, whereas before, a uh, complete care plan from pets at home specifically, companion care specifically, only covered the Nobivac included in the eight pounds a month or whatever it was per year. But now it's eight pounds a month, I think from seven to eight this year, halfway through last year, I think, which now includes both injections plus the rear guard, plus the, I think there's a free consultation with a vet, free nurse consultation, claw clippings, that sort of thing. So it's well worth looking into because it can save you money because the vaccine price can, can swing wildly. Like our local independent vet, it's like 30 pounds. Whereas companion care, it can be 44 pounds twice. Remember, this is two injections. So 88 pounds, 60 pounds. So if you can get them in a care plan that includes both of them, for say eight to 10 pounds a month, plus other accessories that you can get. Some do like free bags of food, or not free, but you know, included bags of food in the cost and, and consultations and things like that. It's well worth doing. This isn't insurance. This is a care plan for your vet. Uh, insurance would be completely different. Well, this has been kind of a heavy first episode, but it is super, super important. For me as a boarder and an owner, I have my own two pests who are over here that you can't really see, but I can see them. Um, and as a rabbit owner yourself to just, just not have the heartache of having a rabbit die for the sake of a vaccine. Well, thank you so much for watching this. This is my first episode, so it might be a bit rough and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Um, the editing might be a bit weird because this is the first time I'm really getting to grips with the editing software. So if you wouldn't mind just having a watch, like, comment and subscribing, let me know what you think because obviously I've got no idea what I'm doing. And hopefully as the days and the weeks go on, this will be a monthly series until I can get to fully grips with editing and getting things sorted and like finding pictures i don't know if i'm gonna have any music you know i have no idea um but if you wouldn't mind just like commenting and subscribing that would be fantastic and if you wouldn't mind ringing the bell then you'll be notified of when my next um video will be out and i get it i hate it when videos do the whole pluggy thing but it does help as this is a very niche little subject um, and I haven't really seen any other proper adult educational videos for rabbits out there going in depth into illnesses, behavior, um, sickness, but also things where, where to find items um, on a budget. Um, like <laughs> some of these things that you get from the vets have like a massive markup on them. So we will be doing a bunny, bu bunny on a budget series and um, looking at where to buy appropriate toys, treats, medication obviously not prescription stuff but like fiberplex paste critical care that sort of thing where best to buy them now this is a uk channel so everything will be uk and all the links to, to any items will be in the description below i would like to thank anyone who has joined as patreon um you are fabulous and i thank you so much it will help continue me to continue to make the channel and, and culture it and grow it. We will be obviously buying items in to test on my two, obviously appropriate things to test on my two. We will also be looking at um, where to buy items, places like Manor Pet Housing, um, Small Paws Playtime, um, ooh, like Vet UK, ViOVet, Animed Direct, places where you can buy things um, for your bunny rabbit. So we will be obviously requiring to buy things in so anyone who's supporting me on Patreon, thank you so much. You are amazing. Obviously, Patreons will have um, various tiers of um, 
exclusive content so the videos will be uploaded a couple of weeks in advance and um, you'll also get things like free bunny biscuits because I make my own bunny biscuits free forage bags uh, depending on the tier that you have we'll be sending those out as well as maybe a couple of other things if you if you know the hay box subscription or the um, bunny box subscription we will potentially be doing something along those lines so once a month included in your patreon package we will send you a little pack of appropriate things for your bunny rabbit and maybe a little guide every week it's slightly different of, of different topics that we will do and things like that but i haven't haven't looked at that yet believe me this is the very infancy of this thing so thank you very much um I currently hold a level three diploma in rabbit care, welfare and physiology and behaviour and I'm intending to do the level four starting like next week um, and then hopefully how that ever goes um, and we're going to be looking to do a HND level five the year after and that'll mean letters after my name so hopefully it'll go well but level four this year. My next video will probably be about basic diet so what you need to look for um, in a rabbit pellet what constitutes rubbish that they potentially would be better eating the bag it comes in and what's the premium pellets and what constitutes a, a good pellet to a crap pellet or the muesli which is even worse that no rabbit should be on anymore but we'll have a look at the basic diets of a rabbit so hay pellets veggies what's suitable for a rabbit how to feed them what to feed them in and obviously water water dispensers via versus water bottles. So thank you so much. Uh, this has been Tyranda Talks. Ty is down here somewhere. Um, and that's it for today. Uh, hopefully I will see you again next month. Um, and as we get better, as I get better at this, hopefully they'll be once every fortnight then. But goodbye from me, Ty and Mal. Oh, and if, if anyone knows and follows me on Facebook, Siri2, who is Cirilla from The Witcher. Um, she was given to us a couple of weeks ago, unwanted, and she's a little red-eyed white. She's only about five, six months old, and we're hoping to bond her to my two as the, the weeks go on and her hormones settle. She's just been spayed, but I'm still seeing her as a rival at the moment, and poor Mal's getting it in the neck. So goodbye from me, Ty, Mal, and Siri, um, and we'll see you again next time.